Better fix now. Yeah. So, just to refresh, I'm Dr. Lowell Bean. I'm an orthopedic surgeon with Tidewater Orthopedics in Hampton, Williamsburg, and Suffolk, Virginia. My specialty is shoulder, and tonight we're going to do an educational talk on outpatient total shoulder replacement. So we're going to talk about shoulder arthritis, what it is, do you have it, if so, what are the symptoms, we'll go over the treatment, we'll talk about shoulder replacements, uh, we'll have time at the end for some questions. So first of all, Tidewater Orthopedics. We are a group of specialized orthopedic surgeons. There are 10 of us in the practice. We each have our own specialty for what we do. We have hand surgery, we have foot and ankle, uh, we have sports medicine, spine surgery, um, several sports medicine surgeons, um, several who specialize in shoulder. So we pretty much have the full spectrum covered. Uh, we tend to stay in our lane, meaning we, we do what we're good at. Uh, we don't try venturing off into something else. I don't do spine, I don't do hip replacements, I don't do hand, foot, and ankle, things like that. I primarily do shoulder and knee surgery. That's, that's kind of my, my area of expertise. We have six physician assistants who work with us. Uh, we've been in the Hampton area for over 45 years now. Uh, we've been in Williamsburg for about 15 years. And we just recently opened an office in Suffolk. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from North Carolina. I did my undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering at Duke. Uh, and decided I didn't want to be an engineer, so I, uh, I always had the idea of being an orthopedic surgeon, even from high school age. Uh, so it was kind of nice to go through the engineering background. It's really helped me a lot in being an orthopedic surgeon. After I finished my studies at Duke, I went to the University of North Carolina where I attended medical school. Um, after that, I did my orthopedic training in Connecticut at Yale University for five years. Following those five years, I did an additional year of training in shoulder and sports medicine at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. There I got to see a lot of the latest and greatest things that were being done for shoulder surgery in particular. Um, it was back then and still is rated the number one hospital in the country for orthopedics. And they have a number of really outstanding shoulder surgeons that I was able to learn from. I moved to Tidewater area of Virginia afterwards in 1995. So I, I've been a member of Tidewater Orthopedics for going on 25 years now. And I like this area because not only the close to the water and the, the people and the, the, the feel of the Tidewater region, but it also was an area where I could come in and specialize in what I wanted to do. It gave me the opportunity very early on to kind of be known as the shoulder guy. And that's really what I like doing. So I was able to keep that specialty going and I've been able to build on it uh, over the years as I continue to do more and more shoulder work and try to stay as up to date as I possibly can on what's new and uh, all of the latest inventions that are coming out for shoulder surgery to try to provide the best possible care I can for my patients. Where I do a lot of these outpatient shoulder surgeries is at the Careplex Orthopedic Ambulatory Surgery Center. We call it the COASC. It's affiliated with the Sentara Careplex Hospital. It's immediately adjacent within the building. Um, it only does outpatient orthopedic surgery. It has one of the lowest infection rates in the state, less than 0.1%, so meaning one out of a, uh, a thousand. It, does almost 4,000 surgeries per year at this location. Our physicians uh, are only orthopedic surgeons. Our anesthesiologists who work there are specialists in doing orthopedic uh, anesthesia. I think it allows us to have a faster recovery by working through a surgery center like this. Our staff are trained just for outpatient orthopedic surgery. It's gonna be a lower cost as compared to having things like this done um, in an inpatient hospital setting. And these days with COVID going around, being in an uh, outpatient setting, I think has a number of advantages there as well. 
So let's talk about what is arthritis uh, first of all. So the picture I have on the screen here is a knee. I didn't have a good picture of shoulder arthritis, but it's the same thing. So let me explain to you what is arthritis. I get asked that question a lot. And the easiest way I have of defining arthritis is to use the analogy if you have, are cooking a chicken and you pulled it apart and you look at the end of the bone, it has a nice white glistening surface to it. That is the cartilage. Every joint has a layer of cartilage that covers the end of the bone. It varies in thickness depending upon the joint, but it is the smooth gliding surface covering the bone. And so there's cartilage on both sides, both the top and bottom. The cartilage completely covers the end of the bone, so there's no exposed bone. It's a nice smooth surface. I like to use the analogy of the Teflon coating of a frying pan. The cartilage is the smooth gliding surface of the knee. So when that breaks down, that's what arthritis is. So the cartilage starts to wear away. In some areas, the underlying bone will be exposed. That's where the nerve fibers are located. So once the cartilage has worn down and the bone's exposed, that's when the pain's gonna really start to set in. Before it has worn completely to bone though, it will start wearing away in uneven areas. So you'll start having some crunching or popping as the shoulder moves because it's no longer this smooth surface. There could be little pieces of cartilage that will break off and float around the joint that can cause pain. And this whole process just inflames and irritates the joint so it starts getting stiff. When the cartilage has completely worn away, now you're bone on bone. Most people have heard of that phrase, that's severe arthritis. By that point, the shoulder's gotten pretty painful. It's gotten stiff. There's crunching and popping. You have pain with pretty much all movement, and that's arthritis. So arthritis isn't something we can go in and take out. It's because it's worn away, so there's nothing to actually remove. Trying to clean up arthritis, meaning trying to clean up the rough edges, may help a little in the earlier stages of arthritis, but once it's reached the point of close to bone on bone, there's really nothing left to clean up um, very simply anymore at that point. So the, the lesser surgeries, the arthroscopic surgeries, by then are not going to be as helpful. So when we get to that point of bone on bone, we're left with the only option for surgery for a more long-term fix being a shoulder replacement. And we'll talk about what that involves. Many people have never heard of a shoulder replacement. They will have friends who have heard of hip or knee replacements, but when I mention a shoulder replacement to them, it's not quite as common. But as we start getting a little bit older, we're gonna start seeing this is gonna be a more common problem uh, going forward. Shoulder replacements are one of the fastest growing replacement surgeries in orthopedics um, because the joint tends to wear out in people who've been very active or done a lot of weight lifting and things like that in the past. So before we get into all of that, we need to have a basic working level of the parts of the shoulder or the shoulder anatomy. So I'm gonna go over that with you now. So the shoulder is composed primarily of two major bones. One is the upper arm bone or the humerus. The other is the shoulder blade or the scapula. And the humerus has a round part called the humeral head that fits into a socket of the shoulder blade or scapula, and that socket is called the glenoid. So the round ball of the joint rotates in the ball, excuse me, in the socket of the glenoid. The ball is pretty round. The socket, however, is fairly shallow. It's not a deep cup like a hip joint is. It's more like a saucer than it is um, a bowl. So the ball is rotating in a, the saucer, but it has a little room to slide back and forth. Uh, that helps give the shoulder 
a lot more range of motion. The shoulder has the most movement of any joint in the body. That's why you can reach your arm all the way overhead. You can reach up your back out to the side. It has a large area of movement, both rotating up and down, out to the side. And that is all because the shoulder joint has, isn't so constrained. It's not a tight ball in a socket. It has some ability to slide back and forth. Holding that ball and socket together is primarily the tendons that make up the rotator cuff. People are well aware of the, hearing the term rotator cuff. It usually carries some terrible um, expression whenever I mention rotator cuff uh, to patients because they know that rotator cuff problems can be pretty painful. So we have four tendons that make up the rotator cuff. This diagram shows one of them, the one coming across the top of the shoulder here called the supraspinatus. I'm going to show you a picture in a second that shows the other parts of the rotator cuff. But these four tendons that make up the rotator cuff go completely around the ball and socket to help hold it in place. It's like the cuff of a shirt. So that's why it's C-U-F-F, -F. it's a rotator cuff. So think of a shirt cuff, those four tendons going all the way around the ball and socket keeping the ball in the socket to hold it together and giving some stability and movement and strength uh, as they move the shoulder. Now, the remaining parts of the shoulder I'll show you here um, uh, briefly are parts of the shoulder blade. There's a bony ledge over the shoulder. That's the hard part that you feel if you press down on top of your shoulder. That's called the acromion your collarbone, your clavicle coming across there, and then there are various little projections of the shoulder that tendons attach to. Let me show you the rotator cuff here a little bit better. So this is a better picture showing how the rotator cuff goes all the way around the ball and socket to hold it in place. There's one tendon of the rotator cuff called the subscapularis that comes directly across the front of the joint. I showed you that supraspinatus, the one across the top uh, before, and then there are two in the back. The infraspinatus and the teres minor are the two uh, parts of the rotator cuff in the back of the shoulder. And so it starts in the back, it goes up the top and then down the front, holding the ball in place. There's a little groove in the bone right there where the biceps tendon is going to run down the arm into the biceps muscle. So. That's the anatomy of a shoulder. So now we can kind of move on and talk a, lot, a little bit about um, shoulder arthritis. So how do you know if you have arthritis? Well, for us, the best way to tell is with x-rays. We can see arthritis actually a little bit better on an x-ray than we often can on an MRI. So the first step I'm going to do when I see somebody that I'm concerned may have arthritis is we're going to do simple x-rays in the office. The way that we can see arthritis on an x-ray is shown here as an example. Here's a normal x-ray of a shoulder. So again, we went over that anatomy, the humeral head or the ball that fits into the socket, the glenoid on that side. There should be a gap between the two because that's where the cartilage is located. And we don't see cartilage on an x-ray. So all we see is this empty space but that tells us that there's cartilage located there. So in this normal looking shoulder, there's a nice round ball, there's a nice smooth socket, that white line is the edge of the socket, and there's a nice gap in between them for the cartilage. Now here on the right is an example of shoulder arthritis. We no longer have that gap between the ball and the socket. That would be bone on bone, the cartilage has completely worn away spurs of bone or extra growths of bone start to form at the bottom of the shoulder and they can be quite large at times. So the bone has, excuse me, the cartilage is worn away, it's bone on bone, extra bone is forming. Over time, this will even progress to the point of the bone wearing down. And I'm gonna show some examples of that uh, in a second and why that can even be a more significant problem for more advanced severe arthritis. 
So that's how we diagnose shoulder arthritis. It's fairly simple, just with a regular x-ray. So what are the symptoms of shoulder arthritis? One of the most common things people will come in with besides pain is stiffness. Shoulder arthritis, less likely in hip or knee, will start to show up as the shoulder being stiffer. You're gonna to start to lose the ability to reach up your back. Ladies will have a difficult time reaching the bra strap. Men can reach the point where it can't tuck in a shirt as easily in the back. Then they'll start noticing it's a little hard to reach all the way overhead or out to the side. As the cartilage wears away and it gets closer to bone on bone, the sh shoulder doesn't have the movement that it once did. The bone stir spurs start to form and that's gonna make it a little bit stiffer as well. You will start having pain with movement, so you reach suddenly or you stretch the shoulder. It's gonna hurt usually in the front of the shoulder, occasionally in the back, less likely on the side. Um, usually pain more on the side of the shoulder. The upper arm is rotator cuff. Arthritis pain is usually a little bit more towards the front or towards the back. As the joint wears away, the cartilage wears down, that's when you'll start having the noises. So it will crunch and pop. When it gets to be severe arthritis, you can hear it across the room. It'll snap and pop as you move it around. And it's usually pretty painful when that happens. Shoulders are notorious for hurting more at night. Usually associated with laying flat. Most people find that if they sit up a little bit, like in a recliner, it's not quite as painful. But any type of shoulder problem often hurts more at night. Pain usually deep in the shoulder, only mild pain uh, at rest. If you're just sitting, not doing much, typically not terribly painful. It's usually more with activity. People with shoulder arthritis will often have arthritis in other joints. Uh, could be the hip, could be the knee, could be the hand uh, or spine. Another common cause of shoulder problems, is, or excuse me, shoulder arthritis, is a history of an injury in the past. <clears throat> Any kind of an old injury, like a dislocation of the shoulder when you were younger, can lead to arthritis many years later. We also are seeing a lot more shoulder arthritis in younger people who have played a lot of sports. It's from repetitive use. In particular, weightlifters have a very high likelihood of developing shoulder arthritis if they were power lifters or really focused on heavy weights. That causes the joint to wear out faster. I'm seeing a lot of particularly men in their 40s and 50s who have a severely arthritic shoulder because they've done a lot of weightlifting when they were younger. So we talked a little bit before about how with shoulder arthritis, this bone can start to wear away a little bit. And I wanna to try to explain that a little bit because it's important when we start talking about replacements. So for a normal shoulder, if we were to take a cross section right through the middle of the shoulder blade, this is the shoulder blade here, and the ball or the humeral head, it should look like a golf ball sitting on a tee. The shoulder blade comes forward, the glenoid or socket is 90 degree or perpendicular to the rest of the shoulder blade, and the ball of the humeral head sits right in the middle of that. That's a normal looking shoulder. But what starts to happen with shoulder arthritis is the back part of the glenoid, the socket, starts to wear away. It's much less likely it's the front part. It usually is gonna wear out the back. So as a result of that, instead of the normal line, which is shown here as the red line, the ball starts to slip out the back because that socket is wearing down. So that's how much now it has worn away and the ball is starting to slip further out the back. You won't feel it slipping, all you'll have is a little limited movement, but the x-ray, and we can often get a CAT scan, will show how much bone has started to wear down. If that continues to progress, 
it becomes more difficult to rebuild that. So what, the reason why I'm bringing this up now is when I talk to people and if I get an x-ray that shows they're starting to get some bone wear, we need to start thinking about replacement a little sooner rather than later because the results will be better with a replacement if you get it done before it has worn too severely. So here's another example of what I was talking about here about the shoulder arthritis x-rays. The top image shows the arthritis where there's no gap. We're bone on bone with the humeral head on the glenoid. We've got the spur at the bottom. I get another type of x-ray that's done looking at it from underneath. So your arm is coming out here. This is the ball, the humeral head. The socket is a little harder to visualize, but the shoulder blade is coming back this direction. The front of the socket is this white line here to go up to form the socket. The red arrow points to what used to be a normal socket. The new socket where it has worn down is now here. So it's no longer coming straight across. It has worn down a separate groove in the back as the ball is now slipping out the back. Here's a CAT scan image of it. So again, the shoulder blade here, the red arrow shows the normal part of the glenoid socket, and you can see the groove that is worn in the back where it has worn down. It no longer looks like a golf ball on the tee. The bone is wearing away. Here's a CAT scan image showing uh, the A is the normal socket. That's the new socket that is formed that has worn down. That's something that's going to have to be addressed when we do a shoulder replacement if we're going to make it work. And if that gets to be too bad, too worn down, we're going to have a little more difficult time building that back up again. And I'm going to show you how we go through some of that planning and what we do. There's one other type of arthritis that I want to describe. The initial type of arthritis I was talking about is the normal wear and tear type of arthritis or osteoarthritis. We can also get arthritis from a large tear in the rotator cuff. That's called rotator cuff tear arthropathy. So if the rotator cuff tears so large that the ball no longer sits in the socket, so the humeral head is here, but the top of the socket there is there and the bottom of the socket is here, the ball has now shifted up because there's no rotator cuff to hold it in place. When that happens, the top of the humeral head starts to rub against that bony ledge of the acromion I was telling you about before. And this will create arthritis as that ball rubs against that bony ledge. So this is a type of arthritis, but it's caused by the lack of a rotator cuff, and it's not the typical osteoarthritis that we were describing before with those other x-rays. So there's two types of shoulder replacements. Um, the first type of shoulder replacement, the anatomic shoulder replacement, is simply replacing the ball, the humeral head, with a metal one. The socket is covered by a plastic socket or glenoid. There's a stem that goes down into the bone to hold, <coughs> excuse me, hold it in place. The rotator cuff is still intact. And this type of shoulder functions more like a normal shoulder does. It's gotten rid of all the arthritis. It is now a metal ball in a smooth plastic socket, so there's no longer the grinding of the shoulder. We should be able to improve the range of motion by doing that. The rotator cuff is gonna still help stabilize the joint together to allow it to move. So I have a model to show you what that actually looks like. We can maybe zoom in a little bit here on what that is. So, here is the humerus. I'll kind of take that apart and show it. The ball of the joint is removed, is cut off. The rest of the bone is left intact. The rotator cuff attaches on the top part here. 
So I remove that worn out ball and now it's going to be replaced with a smooth metal one. They come in different sizes. So we can get the one that best fits the part that was removed. We have two different ways of fixing that in place. One is with the stem I showed on the x-ray. An example here, it has a porous coating on the top surface of it so the bone will grow into it. So we don't typically cement this in place, it's a press fit. So it sits into the hollow center part of the humerus. We, it also comes in different sizes, so we get the one that's gonna fit in there securely. And then the metal ball attaches to it to completely cover the end of the bone. So it's now a smooth metal ball all the way around that will rub into the socket. So the shoulder blade, Again, I described that to you before. This is the shoulder blade or the scapula. It's the end of the scapula where the socket or the glenoid is located. We have a way of smoothing out that bone to create a nice surface that it can then be capped with a plastic piece. Comes also in different sizes. So now it will be the metal ball in the plastic socket moving back and forth rotator cuff is still there holding it together so it's a more normal feel uh, to the shoulder joint when we can do that the glenoid is fixed in place with these little metal pegs or excuse me not metal these plastic pegs that go into the bone the smaller ones are cemented in and then there's a larger one in the middle that the bone grows into. It has little flutes on it that the bone can grow in to make it a stronger fixation long-term. So that's what we call an anatomic shoulder replacement. For people who have good quality bone, we can do another type of fixation on the humerus side using just a small little wedge that fits into the bone with the ball attached to it. It has the same goal of the metal ball and the plastic socket, but frequently can be a little less pain by not having to do anything down the center hollow part of the bone like we had to do with the stem. It requires a good solid bone though to do that. Somebody who is older, has weaker bone, osteoporosis, that doesn't work as well and we would have to go to the other, but that's an option for us as well that I think can often aid us in the ability to do these as an outpatient because we're not having to go down the bone uh, so much to try to get that fixation. So that describes the anatomic shoulder replacement. I'm gonna show you in a second with, um, on the uh, screen how we do some changes for people who have worn away this back part of the socket. Because if that back bone has worn down, this won't fit very well. We have little wedges to the plastic that can help build that part back up again where it has worn down. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a little while. But next, let me show you what a reverse shoulder looks like. So a reverse shoulder replacement is done for people who either don't have a rotator cuff that would hold the ball in the socket or their bone has worn away so severely that we have to add extra bone to build it back up again. In those instances, we do a reverse shoulder. So a reverse shoulder simply reverses the ball and socket. So the same type of cut on the bone of the humerus is made. The ball gets removed. We still will use a stem to go in the bone to hold it in place. But instead of putting the ball there, now we're gonna put a socket on this side. So we put the plastic socket on that side of the joint. And where the socket is now, we don't take off this much bone, this is just the model. Where the socket is now, 
we're going to put a metal ball. So now with a reverse replacement, the socket rotates around the ball instead of the ball rotating in the socket. With this type of a design, we don't need a rotator cuff to hold it together. It stays together pretty well just by that reversal of the ball and socket. So this is the type of replacement that we're gonna to go to for people who have a torn rotator cuff. Or as I said, also severe bone loss um, that we need to bone graft. We also do this type of replacement for people with a bad fracture. So the ball is attached to the rest of the shoulder blade. It has screws that go into the shoulder blade to hold it in place. And that allows uh, the movement. The downside to the reverse replacement is you're somewhat limited in how far the socket can rotate around the ball. So it does a pretty good job for the up and down movement. It's a little more limited in rotating side to side. So I tell people with a reverse shoulder replacement, we usually are gonna do a, a good job for pain relief. We're gonna do a good job for getting you the ability to raise your arm up again overhead. You may still have a difficult time reaching behind you. Usually a goal is maybe to your belt line. Um, it's not gonna rotate out typically quite as far. So if we have a choice, meaning there's an intact rotator cuff, I'm usually gonna try for the anatomic shoulder replacement because I think we can get a little bit better result than we could with a reverse. Some people, uh, some surgeons, will opt for a reverse more quickly just because it tends to be a little bit easier surgery to do. But I think in my hands for long term, we'll get a little better result with an anatomic if we can do that. We can't do it for everybody. You have to have the rotator cuff functioning well, but it, it's, a, it's a good option um, for us. The reverse replacement has been approved in the United States for about 16 years. Um, I've been doing them since that time. It was being done in Europe even sooner than that. So we have pretty good um, data on the reverse replacements for how they're gonna hold up. Um, they tend to have a slightly higher complication rate. Um, so that's again, another reason why I tend to lean a little bit to the anatomic replacement if we can get by with doing that. So let me um, show you um, a little bit here an example of how we can plan for a shoulder replacement and what it looks like when we do it. So we have software now that we can model each person's shoulder, decide what size is going to work best, is there any area of bone that's worn away that we need to build back up, I can essentially template, plan the whole surgery before I ever get in there. So I know what size is gonna work. I know where it needs to fit. If I need to, I can even order a special guide to make sure I can try to get everything exactly in the right spot for where we want it to be. So here's an example of how we do that. So this is um, the software that I use. Each company kind of has their own uh, the type of shoulder implant that um, I use uh, uses this called Blueprint um, software. Uh, it's really, I think, made a huge difference for me knowing exactly what I'm going to get into when I, I do the surgery. So starting on the right, excuse me, on the left side here, this is the CAT scan image I showed you before of how a shoulder should look with the shoulder blade here. The yellow line kind of shows the middle of where it's supposed to be. The blue line shows the edge of the glenoid. We don't want it tilted too far back. We want it pretty much perpendicular. It says the retroversion is four degrees. That means it's four degrees off of 90. Not bad. We can certainly live with that. The ball is pretty well centered in the glenoid. So that's going to be a fairly straightforward shoulder. So we can turn it to look at it. 
in kind of a 3D picture here on the right side. So I know how the shoulder's gonna look. I can see where the bone spurs are located. I can look around to the back. Okay, we got a little spurs through there. This program shows me how much of the ball is within the front part of the socket, which is the green, and how much is in the back part, which is the blue. So it's pretty close to 50-50, which is not bad. So we would plan an anatomic shoulder in this, look, in, in this instance. So I can choose the different sizes. Uh, here we've chosen a, a medium. If I tried to go large, it gives me a, a red sign, meaning I'm too big. I'm better off being with the smaller one, the medium. So I go back to that. That's gonna be a pretty good fit. I can spin it to make sure it's gonna fit. That doesn't look very good. There's a gap here between the bone and the implant, so I don't want that. So I have to do some things to try to make that sit better. So I can move it back a little bit. to make it sit a little bit better on the socket. And now we've got a pretty flush surface where that socket is going to fit right against the bone. I can spin it around to look at the front part. Okay, we're good, it's sitting there very nice. I can look at the CAT scan images. Yeah, I like how it's sitting there. Everything's nice and smooth. I can go to the ball side, the humerus side. I don't like how they put that there. I can raise it up a little bit to make it fit better. I can change the sizes of it to make sure I'm gonna fit in there more evenly within the, the bone here where it's gonna be a nice tight fit between the bones to choose the size. I decide which size ball is going to be the closest to um, making up the same size as what I'm taking out. And then it will give me an example. I keep wanting to touch that monitor. It keeps giving me an example of what the shoulder joint is going to look like when we're done. The ball fitting in the socket. Here's what the front view is going to look like. I can spin the joint around. Okay, yeah, I like how that's sitting. I see where the bone spurs are at the bottom down here that I need to make sure I take off when I do the surgery. And I know the sizes I'm going to use and how it's going to sit. And so that really makes a big difference, I think, in helping me plan the surgery. It makes the surgery go smoother uh, because the, my staff knows here's the size that we're looking for. Let me show you one more example here of a, one where the socket is really worn down and we're gonna have to try to do something else to make that up. Uh, so it's loading now. Now here is an example of a really worn away socket. The 37 degrees, it should be zero. Our last one, remember, was four degrees. It wasn't off much at all. This one, that back part of the socket has really worn down. When we look at this image with the blue and the green, there's very little blue, which means most of the ball is shifting out the back. That's gonna be a problem when we try to do a replacement because if I put the replacement right there, the ball's gonna keep slipping out the back and it's not gonna hold up very well. So I'm gonna to have to do something to make up that difference for where the bone has worn away. We have a couple of ways of doing that. As I was saying before, we have the option of a type of glenoid that has a wedge in the back. So here's an example of what that looks like. The back part of the plastic is much thicker than the front part. So it's going to build up that back part that has worn away. So it's going to help pull that back, the ball back centered where it's supposed to be. I'm going to have to take off a little more bone in the front for that to sit down the way it's supposed to but now the back part of the socket is now much thicker, taking into account where it has worn away. Kind of the same steps now that we did before with planning the humerus. 
We can go through and kind of size that real quick, show you what the joint is going to look like now with the ball sitting in the socket now with a much thicker socket. Here's that CAT scan image now. It looks more like a golf ball sitting on a tee. The ball is now in line with the rest of the shoulder blade. It's not sitting out the back like it was before. I've built back up that back part of the socket and that's going to make the shoulder a more natural movement, but it's also going to help things last longer. It's not going to wear out nearly as fast by doing that. Let me show one more and then we'll kind of be finished with that. I'll show you what a reverse replacement looks like um, for when we have to do those. With a reverse replacement, the bone wear is more at the top of the glenoid. Because the rotator cuff isn't there to hold it in place, the ball is going to slip up the top um, and it's going to cause some bone wear along the um, top of the glenoid instead of the back. So here's an example where the well, this would be looking at it from the front, the ball and the glenoid. The glenoid isn't straight up and down very much. It's tilted more at an angle because the top part is wearing down. There's not a rotator cuff holding that in place. There's also a little wear in the back. So this person has wear in several different locations of their glenoid. We're not going to be able to do an anatomic shoulder in this uh, person. There's too much bone wear in the back. There's too much bone wear on the top. There is almost no bone of the humeral head that's where it's supposed to be. The blue, everything is green, 95% uh, slipping out the back. So in those instances, we're going to have to plan on a reverse. I'm also going to typically in these cases plan to add some extra bone to it. We can do um, a bone graft, we can add some extra bone there to give it uh, some reinforcement for where the bone has started to wear down. So here is an example of how we plan a reverse. With the bone graft. So the bone graft is shown in the brown. We can add extra bone there to build it up. We put the, call it the base plate, it's the part that the ball attaches to on top of that bone graft. The screws aren't shown in this model because they go into the bone, but you can see kind of how the bone graft there is going to add a little bit extra to it. From a side view, this shows how the ball is going to sit on that new um, base plate that's holding it to the rest of the scapula and the glenoid. We can still plan for our humerus kind of the same way that we did before. That's where now the ball has been removed. We got the socket that I showed you. With the new joint, the socket is going to move around the ball. So that's how it's going to look now. You can't see the ball very well. It doesn't show up as well in this program, but it's sitting right there and the socket rotating around it. And we've restored it back to the normal lined up with the rest of the shoulder blade like it's supposed to. The nice thing about this is I can do the planning and it will then tell me what kind of movement I expect to get out of it. So I can make some changes here. What if I went with a different size or what if I shifted it a little bit? I can hit replay and it will then take it through another set of movement and I can decide beforehand, here's what's going to work best to help this shoulder move better. So that kind of goes over maybe a little more detail than you, uh, than you, you wanted, but I wanted to kind of show some of the newer advances that we have now for shoulder replacements take you through a little bit of why I think certain things are important for how we plan this. 
It also, I think, gives you um, an idea of the technology, how it's changing. I'm hopeful that within a year or so, we may even be able to use a robot to help put this in. We'll plan it like this beforehand. The robot will assist us as we literally get everything exactly like we've templated it beforehand to give us the best possible result. So the technology is really changing. And the CAT scan, I think, has really um, made a big difference in my surgeries over the past few years, helping me plan them to hopefully get the best result. So now just one, a few last things on outpatient shoulder replacement. Why do it as an outpatient? Well, obviously not being in a hospital is a nice feature. <clears throat> you can recover in your own home. There's a lower infection risk by having surgeries at an outpatient surgery center as compared to being in the hospital. Potentially lower cost, depending upon your insurance. And you get the state-of-the-art technology. You get the pain management. We do a nerve block, which means before the surgery, the anesthesiologist gives you a shot of essentially Novocaine into the nerves at the base of the neck it completely numbs up the shoulder and arm. You still go to sleep for the surgery. No one really kind of wants to have to stay in one position uh, during the surgery um, or, or hear the noises. So typically we'll still go to sleep for it, but when you wake up, you're really not hurting. The nerve block is still numbed up the arm. It's easy enough to go home. Uh, the nerve block will often last at least 12 to 24 hours, sometimes even a little bit longer. I did one yesterday morning. We called the gentleman about five o'clock this evening, still have minimal pain. So it allows you to go home. You can get started on pain medication as the um, pain starts to uh, occur. And the pain's usually not horrible. Usually I tell people the recovery from this is actually a little bit easier than rotator cuff. It's a little bigger surgery, but not typically as painful. Um, and the recovery is often uh, faster as well. So are you a good candidate for an outpatient shoulder replacement? Well, you have to have a good support system at home. Um, you have to be in generally good health. Uh, people with heart disease or on dialysis or bad sleep apnea or major obesity will tend to keep them overnight and go home the next morning just to keep an eye on their overall health. But for everybody else, I think outpatient shoulder replacement now is a good option. For people who have Medicare, <clears throat> at this point, Medicare hasn't allowed uh, or authorized a shoulder replacement as an outpatient. We can do them as an outpatient in a hospital setting, but we can't do them at the COASC but for that reason. They allow hip and knee replacements, but not yet shoulder. And I'm hopeful that shoulder will soon be approved uh, for Medicare to be done there as well. So I went through that pretty quickly, but if um, people have questions, we can start taking questions and we can go over it in a little more detail. While the questions are coming in, I'll describe to you the recovery process for shoulder replacements. Uh, I keep people in a sling for four weeks. The reason for doing that is to do a replacement that front part of the rotator cuff called the subscapularis has to be peeled back to get into the joint to do the replacement. I repair it back on the way out and I wanna make sure that heals. So I keep in a sling for four weeks to allow that to heal. The replacement parts that we put in are rock solid immediately. So they're not coming loose. You're not going to knock something out of place but I wanna make sure that rotator cuff heals. So you're in a sling for four weeks, but we don't want it to get stiff. So I start physical therapy two or three days after surgery. While you're in the sling, you're gonna to go to a physical therapist three days a week. The therapist lifts the arm for you. It's called passive movement. While you're in the sling though, it's okay to use your hand in front of you. You can use a phone, you can use a keyboard, you could reach up to your face. I don't want you reaching up to the top of your head. That pulls your arm too far away from your body. But you can reach up to your mouth for feeding and things like that. 
Anything with your hand down at your side or in front of you is okay to do. After the four weeks, we get rid of the sling. Then you are allowed to start moving it on your own. Still going to physical therapy, but they've added new exercises. At about eight weeks after surgery, I let you start lifting and doing some strengthening exercises. And most people are usually completing the physical therapy between two and three months after surgery. By then, you usually have back pretty good range of motion. A lot of it depends though on how stiff it was when we started. And you're able to just do the exercises at, your, um, at home. From a pain standpoint, the majority of patients tell me within two or three weeks after a replacement, the pain is already getting better than it was prior to the replacement. So that's what's different than a rotator cuff. A rotator cuff is still painful for much longer, but a shoulder replacement, the pain starts getting better pretty quickly. Then it's just a matter of getting the movement back. You have a waterproof bandage covering the incision. I super glue the incision. There's no stitches or staples to come out. With the waterproof bandage, you're able to shower the next day, um, put on regular clothes, put the sling on. Um, so that's why we're able to manage this pretty well at home. So questions? All right, first question. Mm -hmm. How long does the shoulder, the shoulder replacement last? Shoulder replacements, um, we, I tell people the general rule is we expect a shoulder replacement to last in the neighborhood of about 20, 25 years. Um, some of that depends on whether it's an anatomic shoulder or a reverse shoulder. They tend to loosen or fail a little differently. Uh, with the anatomic shoulder replacement, the failure is usually going to be on the plastic socket side. It will start to come loose and could potentially require being redone. Or some people with an anatomic shoulder replacement years later may tear the rotator cuff and then we're going to have to change it to a reverse replacement. But the general thinking is maybe 20, 25 years with the newer technology that we have for putting them in, I'm hoping that's going to be much longer. Uh, reverse replacements, a little bit more stress on the ball where it fits onto the shoulder blade. So there's maybe a little higher likelihood of that wearing out a little faster. But we still just don't have great data on it. As I said, the reverse replacement's only been in the U.S. since about 2003, 2004. Uh, so we don't have as much long-term data on the reverse replacement. All right. What kind of activities will you be able to do or not do like when it comes to exercise or whatnot? So with a shoulder replacement, I tell people it's fine to get back to pretty much all activities that you want to do as long as it's not heavier lifting. So for Guys who have come to see me and we're having to do a shoulder replacement when they're in their early 50s because they wore it out weightlifting, I tell them it's okay to go back to weightlifting, but it's going to be more reps, less weight. So not a good idea to go back to trying to power lift. Not a great idea to go back to trying to do a heavy bench press. This is a mechanical part. The heavier stress you put on it, the faster it's going to wear out. But people are easily able to go back to tennis and golf and they're running and they're doing, they're skiing, they're doing pretty much everything they want to do again with a shoulder replacement. All right, how soon can you drive after the surgery? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, you're in a sling for four weeks. So a lot of that depends on how safe you feel trying to drive with a sling on. You certainly can't drive while you're on pain medication. Um, if you had to turn the wheel suddenly with both arms and you're in a sling, you're going to have a difficult time doing that. So it's usually not advised to try driving while you're in the sling. I do have people who will start to drive once they're off the pain medicine. They keep that arm at the bottom of the wheel. They say they drive with one arm anyway. I caution them to be careful um, and to just do short distances. Certainly when you come out of the sling at four weeks, you're allowed to drive. <clears throat> All right. Can arthritis still affect the bones around the replacement? No. Well, with the replacement, all of the arthritis is removed, and there's really no other area for it to come back in. So we don't see arthritis come back again after a joint replacement. All right. I'm going to try my best to a ask this question. Person had slap on the right shoulder, did sib scapularis test, it hurts, 
sleeps on right, hurts at night. Now left shoulder hurts as well. Can place left lower hand at low back, can do ER on both sides with minimal pain, and sleeps, uh, prefers to sleep on the sofa sitting up. Oh. So obviously having still problems with the shoulder, it would need a good workup. Um, it's hard to tell just from that description whether it could be arthritis or not. So I think x-rays are gonna be necessary to see how much arthritis has started to occur. If you've had previous repairs, especially of the cartilage in the shoulder, that's a snap repair, there's a little higher likelihood of arthritis setting in in the future, so it's a possibility. Um, the limited movement can be due to multiple other things, so it's gonna require starting with some x-rays, then kind of good physical exam to see is this arthritis or is there something else going on that maybe we can fix with a cortisone shot or some physical therapy, something else the, besides the going to a replacement. All right. I didn't go into so much the non-operative treatment of um, shoulder arthritis. It's similar to the treatment that we do for arthritis in other joints. If you have a joint that's inflamed and irritated, we try to quiet it down with medicines for inflammation like Motrin or we try to do a cortisone shot in the joint to settle down that inflammation. The arthritis is still there, it's not going away, but we're just trying to quiet it down. Some people will try a little therapy, but I found that if you try stretching an arthritic joint, it often just makes it hurt more. So I'd like for you to stay active and keep things moving, but we're not gonna really try to regain a whole lot more mobility. Um, Occasionally therapy can help. We usually aren't gonna use that as the first line of treatment. We'll try to do things first to calm down the inflammation. Often go into a cortisone shot. <clears throat> One thing about a cortisone shot though, we're limited in how often we can do it. It has to be spaced out by at least three to four months between shots. Continued cortisone shots over the years can make the arthritis progress a little faster. We would have to keep checking x-rays to make sure that the bone isn't wearing away or something that's going to result in a less optimal outcome when it comes time for a replacement. So for people who are kind of going down that path, we're gonna keep a close eye and make sure that they don't let it go too long. Uh, the other thing with a replacement is if you have an injection, a cortisone shot, you have to wait at least three months, maybe even a little longer before we will do a replacement. It increases the risk of infection if they're done too close together. All right, how long after surgery are you able to play tennis? I let people go back to doing ground strokes uh, by about three months. Um, they're comfortable doing overhead serves, typically four to five months. Uh, to easily play, yes. The pain's usually much better, their movement's better, um, and yeah, they're pleased with being able to do that again. All right, um, this person says that they were suggested bilateral shoulder replacements a year ago, bone on bone. Are they damaging themselves further by waiting? Two things with that, by waiting to have a shoulder replacement. And this is why I think it's important for people to get this checked earlier rather than later. First thing is, we discussed earlier how with shoulder arthritis, you start to lose movement. As you lose that movement, the ability to raise the arm up, we're gonna have a harder time getting that back again when you finally have it replaced. So shoulder replacements are gonna do a great job for pain relief. If I see somebody who can only lift their hand to barely touch the top of their head when it's time for a replacement, I'm gonna get them better. It'll go a little higher, but I'm not gonna get it all the way straight up again like if we had done it sooner. So that's one factor, is you may be doing harm if you're losing more movement in the shoulder. The second thing is, is the bone starting to wear away? Is that socket starting to wear down? because if it is worn down to where that last example I showed where I have to do a reverse replacement instead of an anatomic replacement, the result's not gonna be quite as good. You're gonna lose a little rotation as a result. I can still get good pain relief. I can still get you lifting your arm up and down, 
but the overall result may not be quite as good if you've let it go too far. All right. How long after receiving a cortisone shot can a reverse replacement be performed? It needs to be at least three months. Um, with all joint replacements, they've shown that having a replacement soon after a shot increases the risk of infection. Some surgeons will even recommend six months after a cortisone shot um, before doing a replacement. I tend to go three to four. The most devastating complication of any joint replacement is an infection. If you get an infection, the whole joint has to be removed to clear up the infection before you can put another one back in again. So it's a major deal. So we do everything we can to prevent that. Can you have the surgery if you are on blood thinner Plavix and you can't come off it? We typically will have people see their cardiologist ahead of time. Um, there are several ways around that. If the cardiologist we will typically make a recommendation saying it's okay to come off of Plavix for a few days. The one example here is if you had a cardiac stent, they're going to make us wait six months, uh, some maybe a year before you can come off. So we couldn't do a replacement during that timeline. But if, it, if that's not the case, they'll usually let you come off Plavix just for a few days to have the replacement and then immediately start back on it. I start you back on it the same night as surgery. For those who can't come off of Plavix and the cardiac stent isn't the issue, we have other uh, blood thinning medications, Lovenox, that we can use as a short-term bridge that we can stop 24 hours, get started right back on something again right after surgery. So it would come in consultation with the cardiologist for their recommendation. How long does the surgery take? Uh, depends on the severity. Uh, for the, like the first example I showed where there's not a whole lot of bone wear and it's a pretty straightforward shoulder replacement from start to finish, we say skin to skin, meaning opening and closing, um, the surgery is about an hour and a half, two hours at most, maybe even a little shorter, could be a little, just a little over an hour. For a more complex shoulder where we've really got a lot of bone loss, I'm having to make a lot of adjustments to try to build things up then we may be stretching closer to the two hour mark. Um, rarely do, are we going over that. All right, can the reverse shoulder replacement be outpatient? Uh, the reverse replacement can be outpatient. Uh, I've done a number outpatient. The problem is going to be insurance. Uh, we have to make sure that we've got an insurance that's going to approve a, a reverse replacement in an outpatient setting. But yes, it can also be done as an outpatient. Is it possible that a patient can't regain uh, previous mobility, like throwing a baseball, even after slap repair? Uh, slap repairs are typically associated with stiffness. They, um, that's one of the um, potential complications of slap repairs. I've started limiting slap repairs to generally people under 40 years of age, unless there is some other underlying abnormality within the shoulder. And it's because we tend to see stiffness um, developing and they don't heal as well as we get older. So there's other ways of dealing with a slap tear for people who are a little bit older and unfortunately a little older is over 40. All right, how long does pre-surgery planning take from the first office visit? So I see you, we get the x-rays, we talk about the shoulder replacement, um, my surgery scheduler gets in touch with you. She orders the CAT scan. We get that done. That usually something that's a week or so uh, to actually get the replacement, especially as an outpatient. We're doing that within a month. Uh, it depends on whether you're going to require medical uh, clearance or not, whether you're going to have to see a cardiologist. It requires the usual blood work prior to surgeries. Uh, but we usually can get these scheduled depending on the time of year uh, or the setting where we have to do the surgery. Uh, usually it's going to be within a month, sometimes um, even faster within two or three weeks. All right. What is the anesthesia used in a reverse shoulder replacement? How long is the stay in the hospital? So the, there's no difference in the anesthesia or the recovery time for an anatomic versus a reverse. Um, I do them the same way. The 
Um, anesthesia is the same with a nerve block. As I said, it's typically going to last close to 24 hours in most cases. Um, for people with underlying medical problems, we keep them overnight. Um, reverse replacements, we tend to usually do in people who are a little older than we would an anatomic replacement. Uh, older people are going to have more problems like the tear of the rotator cuff or the bone loss that's going to make us need to do a reverse replacement in them. So by nature of the age, usually there's going to be some other underlying medical problems. So reverse replacements tend to stay overnight a little more commonly than the anatomic replacements. But that's the only reason why. It's not because the surgery itself was more painful or that much more difficult. It's the age of the patient and the need just to watch them overnight. It is extremely unusual for anyone to stay more than one night. It's usually less than 23 hours, you're going home. <clears throat> All right, if a patient had a slap tear uh, after the, over the uh, age of 40, what would be the surgical option? So in those cases, we do what's called a biceps tenodesis. The biceps tendon attaches to this cartilage, the labrum, that causes the slap tear. We don't try repairing the tear, we just remove the biceps from the tear, reattach it in a different location, and that takes care of the problem uh, without us getting into the stiffness and the difficulty healing the slap tear uh, in somebody who's over 40. Approximately how long after rotator cuff and bicep surgery on one shoulder before you can have the other shoulder done? So a rotator cuff uh, recovery is going to be a little longer than a shoulder replacement. You're still going to be in a sling for usually about a month. Typically it's going to require about three months of therapy, but even at three months there's still a little stiffness, there's still a little weakness in the shoulder. But I usually about two months will tell people, okay, you can start thinking about getting the other rotator cuff done uh, at that point. I certainly wouldn't recommend it for at least six weeks. You want to at least have some function back in the other arm if the, the second one's going to be in a sling for four weeks. All right, well, thank you all very much for, this, um, for coming together tonight uh, virtually to talk a little bit more about shoulders. I always love talking about shoulders. It's really my passion for what I love to do. So if there's any questions, you feel free to make an appointment. You can do that on our website, tidewaterortho.com. Uh, we have the ability to make appointments directly online. You can also call us at our central number, which is 757-827-2480. Uh, just request whether you want to be seen in Hampton or Williamsburg for me. I don't go to the Suffolk office, but we do have doctors down there in Suffolk. Um, uh, who can see as well if you're down in the uh, south side area and don't want to cross the tunnel. But hope you have a good evening and thanks for the opportunity of talking to you.